morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, hello and welcome on behalf of the Learning and Development Group of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action to the Adapting CAFOG Programming in the Context of COVID-19 when you're on webinar. We are looking forward to our time together today. My name is Michelle Van Aken, and I will be your moderator during this webinar. I work with Plan International USA um, and with funding from USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, Plan is supporting the LMD Working Group in developing capacity building resources for child protection actors to support adapting to COVID-19 realities. Uh, so Today we are focusing on children associated with armed forces and armed groups and how CAFOG programming has had to adapt and adjust during COVID-19 and what we've learned in the year since, or the year and a half since the onset of the pandemic. Uh, every day a child stays with an armed force or armed group. He or she is at risk of physical, psychological, and sexual violence and even death. Prevention of recruitment and use, separating children from armed forces and groups, supporting the reintegration process, and responding comprehensively to their needs are all life-saving interventions. Actions to address the needs of CAFOG must continue in spite of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Over a year later, the Learning and Development Working Group, in collaboration with the CAFOG Task Force, has put together a panel of CAFOG specialists to share learning challenges and adaptations. Um, the LD Working Group and the CAFOG Task Force have also worked together to develop some capacity building resources on programming uh, for CAFOG during COVID-19, which we will introduce at the end of the webinar. We do have uh, three panelists joining us today, as well as one panelist who will be represented by um, our colleague, Sandra, uh, the co-lead of the CAFOG Task Force. We'll be hearing from Vanessa Saraiva, a humanitarian and protection advocacy advisor from World Vision in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We'll be hearing from Irene Mwangi, uh, head of office from Search for Common Ground in Nigeria. Christopher Chine Dumuji, uh, CEO of programs from Go um, Prime Organization in, in Nigeria. And our fourth panelist who unfortunately could not join us today is Alpha Rook Hadera, program supervisor to uh, Group d'appui à la formation de base. Um, he was not able to make the webinar today, so Sandra Magnan, uh, uh, CAFOG advisor from Plan International and co-leader of the CAFOG uh, task force will be presenting on his behalf throughout the panel discussion. Um, following the presentation, Katie Robertson, uh, co-leader of the L&D Working Group, will be sharing new resources developed by the L&D Working Group with funding from BHA. Um, we would like to start our session uh, with each panelist giving a brief introduction to the, to the unique context that they work in. Um, Sandra, would you like to start us off and present Al Farouk's slide from Mali? Yes, yeah, sure. So um, there are various forms of recruitment in Mali, and the most frequent one is quote unquote voluntary um, recruitment with some exceptions. So most children are used for tasks such as weapon carriers, messengers, cooks, uh, and as well as for sexual purposes. Um, there are various recruitment factors in Mali, um, including insecurity and violence. Um, there is a proliferation of armed groups and uh, intensification of intercommunity conflicts which leads to insecurity and violence. There is also an, an increase in the immigration of young people to Algeria. Um, there are also uh, very weak uh, basic social services or even absent in, in some locations, and that includes education. So last year, for example, there is a, a large number of schools who have been closed uh, due to insecurity. Uh, there is also a lack of socioeconomic opportunities and prospect for youth. And uh, there is also some family pressures, uh, mainly for the protection of property and the integrity of the family and the community. So all of these are um, risk factors to recruitment in, in Mali. Thank you, Sandra. That's really helpful to help situate the, the conversation during the panel discussion. Um, Irene and Christopher, would you like to share next on the Nigeria context? Uh, thank you. Um, so, um, Northeast uh, Nigeria, I'll be, uh, I'll be presenting uh, the context of Northeast Nigeria. 
So with over a decade uh, of insurgency in the area, um, we have experienced a lot of uh, children being recruited into the armed groups. And uh, the major uh, conflicting parties are the, the, the non-state armed groups and also the, the government forces. So um, we also have under the, the state uh, recognized uh, security group, we have a group called uh, CJTF, Civilian Joint Task Force, uh, which is which was formed in 2013 to, to protect uh, communities again is the non-state uh, uh, armed groups and according to the report by the UN Secretary General in, in 2017 it showed that um, the two groups that are that are using children uh, as combatants were the N NSAGs, the non-state uh, armed groups, and also the CJTF, the, 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 the local uh, uh, security group. So through advocacy uh, of UNICEF, uh, the, there was a there was a peace agreement. There was an agreement that was signed between uh, with the with the CJTF, uh, and the agreement was that they would they would release all the children who have been recruited uh, into their forces, and they would not recruit any more children. So following that, we had over three thousand children being released uh, and reintegrated uh, back into the. They were released and they needed to be reintegrated back into the community. So that uh, raised uh, a major uh, need uh, for, for mechanisms to make sure that these children are were reintegr uh, reintegrated back into the communities and that the communities are ready to receive them. So that is the Northeast uh, context in a nutshell. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Irene. Um, and Vanessa, would you like to share the context in South Sudan. <laughs> yes, thanks. Um, so thank you so much um, for having me uh, again. I had the pleasure of speaking on a similar topic last year, so I'm just going to provide a bit on of an update on South Sudan um, first. So according to the Secretary General's report, the last couple of years have seen an increase in recruitment um, as the reintegration processes of armed groups was underway following the peace deal, um, and also as a way to for groups to mark territory, so to speak, and demonstrate strength of forces. Uh, the latest UN report on children in armed conflict does note 165 grave violations, of which 62 of those are recruitment. Um, it's particularly important to note, though, that these are only verified cases, uh, and therefore we can expect and we do see greater numbers of recruitment, including instances of re-recruitment that are not verified yet. Um, so also important to note is the difference between formal and informal releases. So the 44 children that are listed there as being released in 2020 does not include the children that have escaped or were let go without going through formal uh, DDR processes that are facilitated by the government, UNMIS, um, and UNICEF. So this, of course, does impact the picture and the resources that are necessary when we're meeting the unique needs of children. Uh, regarding gender sensitive DDR, um, I'll say that it's important to prioritize gender assessments um, and child participation in the design of programs. So for example, survivors of rape, um, young brides and mothers, they do need specialized social services particularly when you're helping them to determine um, what are appropriate next steps with respect to school or, or livelihoods opportunities. Um, so when I shared last year, COVID has significantly impacted the release of children. This was halted uh, due to various restrictions. For example, child protection not seen as a life-saving service by the government. Um, verification committees that were not able to travel or family tracing and reunification was also slowed. Um, so in addition, continuity of care was affected, caseworker trainings were stopped or otherwise attempted online. Um, yeah, so it was, it was quite a bit difficult, particularly as schools and vocational centers were also closed. Uh, so that's, that's that Sudan in a very quick nutshell. Uh, so in the DRC, officially verified statistics um, do demonstrate a decrease in recruitment. So again, the situation remains complex, 
Um, there's currently a state of siege in a couple of provinces here in the DRC, particularly in the East Zone, um, which have observed some concerning trends. Um, so in some areas, you're seeing increased release of children so that they are not found to be in conflict in the law, which speaks a lot about their rights and access to justice. Um, and in other areas, you're seeing the recruitment of children um, as a form of, of protective measure. So again, to strengthen numbers. These contexts uh, are both complex. There are various drivers of recruitment. Um, very glad to hear from my, my colleague and panelist who spoke about um, both forced and voluntary recruitment. Um, there's several drivers, poverty, lack of opportunities, um, economic, education, having children feeling empowered or, or having a sense of belonging to a particular group, especially when these groups are so ingrained in the fabrics of society and communities. Um, World Vision did do a multi-country report on this voluntary or forced recruitment a couple of years ago, which remains relevant. So I'm happy to share that um, with all of you. Uh, Child-sensitive DDR is imperative in the DRC, and of course, the Sudan, um, but being able to apply child-focused lens to our responses, uh, recognizing that while many of these children do ha have life experiences that are far beyond their years, uh, for example, young girls who are now mothers themselves. Uh, they're still children and they require that specialized support. Uh, in the DRC specifically, there's an evolving uh, conversation with respect to MONUSCO's transition and the government's role in planning and leading uh, the DDR framework. There's still a lot of work and advocacy to be done uh, to highlight the needs and response necessary for children specifically in the DDR process, because uh, currently it, it's spoken of rather generally in terms of ex-combatants um, and not the specific needs of children in, in that process. Um, it's imperative, this has a domino effect on access to justice programs, legal services, and we need to ensure that um, the rights of children in conflict with the law are respected. Um, generally speaking, impacts of COVID-19 have only aggravated existing vulnerabilities, um, hampered access to education and other social services, limited child protection activities, um, and exposed girls and boys to grave violations, um, specifically recruitment and use, abduction, and sexual violence. Um, I'll pause there for now, but thank you. Thank you so much, Vanessa, and thank you to each of our panelists for, for providing us with that rich background information and insight into your contexts. Um, we'll now dive into the panel discussion. So the first question we would like to hear from uh, the panelists on is, what are the challenges you have faced and what were the main adaptations made to CAFOG programming in your context during COVID-19? Um, I think I will, Vanessa, ask you to go first. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so I was in South Sudan at the outset of the pandemic. Um, at the national level, there were several government restrictions um, on curfew, gathering numbers, and the use of protective equipment, quite standard. Um, most concerning, though, particularly from a programming perspective, was the classification of which services were considered as life-saving. Only life-saving services were able to be implemented by organizations. And as you might imagine, especially in this, in this group of child protection practitioners, unfortunately, child protection services were not considered life-saving. Um, so in South Sudan, this, these sudden programmatic restrictions meant that we had former CAFAG um, essentially stuck in Juba with their social workers because travel was forbidden. And so family tracing and reunification efforts were halted. This meant extra time away from their communities and impact the progress um, of their social reintegration. In both South Sudan and the DRC, we had to close child friendly spaces, vocational skills training centers and schools. Um, these are spaces where many vulnerable children who do need additional support services wouldn't be identified. Um, and given the rate of informal releases, this does become a missed opportunity to identify and respond to children and survivors. Uh, so adaptations made were small, but enabled us to continue our work. So without CFS or meeting spaces, we increased door-to-door -door case management. Um, there are pros and cons to this approach. Individualized support is always, always welcome. 
Um, but the terrain, distance, and being able to reach uh, numerous children per day is affected. Um, in the DRC, once spaces were able to be reopened, we adjusted the number of children present. Um, so for example, at vocational centers, they do follow a strict uh, curriculum. We increased the number of teachers at those vocational skills centers, added an additional day of learning to be able to meet the same number of children and, and catch up on missed lessons, while also respecting, of course, new practices around spacing and, and group gatherings. Uh, we added dedicated staff for hygiene compliance and also included COVID-19 messaging and life skills lessons. Uh, we provided our social workers uh, with personal protective equipment, um, included COVID-19 prevention and awareness in our community sensitization activities, and adjusted any trainings and community engagement to respect gathering guidelines and distancing protocols. Um, I'll, I'll make a final point, quite large, um, quite a large challenge, and that's the, the funding and the negative impact that this had on CAFI programming. Um, this is a global pandemic and so resources are tight. In Sudan, for example, UNICEF's appeal for their 2020 CAFAG implementation was 89% underfunded. And so this ended strategic partnerships and CAFAG response programming. We saw donor governments diverting previously allocated funding for their own national COVID-19 responses or related international efforts. Um, so while the international community has certainly come together uh, to respond to COVID-19, quite frankly, it's been at the expense of other priorities um, and humanitarian crises that, that do exist. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. That's um, especially your, your point at the end around uh, lack of funding and underfunding for this important piece of work is particularly interesting. And I remember um, other of our panelists discussing the fact that child protection was not necessarily considered a life-saving intervention as a major challenge for CAFAG programming during COVID-19. Um, Christopher, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on what were the challenges you have faced and the main adaptations made to CAFAG programming in your context during COVID-19. Thanks a lot, Michelle. Like uh, agreeing totally with Vanessa on the challenges um, around uh, family tracing and uh, reunification being a concern and uh, children um, being stalked in, um, in, in a camp with uh, social workers. We, we anticipated this coming um, because uh, while the, we're waiting, to, waiting for the declaration of uh, COVID in Nigeria, we're also following up with other contexts and trying to learn from what they're doing. So that um, we saw the need to actually come up with a business continuity plan to ensure that even with the, the come with the declaration of COVID in Nigeria and all the measures that will follow after, uh, such as the lockdown and all that, that uh, will continue with programming. Uh, Go Prime here in Nigeria, it's more focused on uh, um, on uh, center-based uh, socioeconomic reintegration. Uh, after which Sack for Common Grants follows through at the, at the community level. So at the center, we had to come up with, uh, in, um, we had several um, uh, meetings with the State Ministry of Health and uh, the, the uh, Nigerian Center for Disease Control to ensure that uh, um, um, protocols, uh, uh, protocols for prevention uh, are implemented in the, in the center. And uh, the, seeing that family tracing was going to be uh, uh, was going to be a concern, we try to figure out strategies to have the kids uh, in the rehabilitation center uh, more comfortable with uh, the long uh, stay in the the long stay in the center. So what we did was that we we had to come up with new initiatives to have them very, very much engaged uh, so that they don't get tired. Uh, remember in principle, uh, uh, children uh, in the rehabilitation center shouldn't be, should be a minimum of, uh, the duration is a minimum of eight weeks and a maximum of 12 weeks. So, and not having a certainty of when the lockdown will be lifted. So we had to come up with uh, initiatives to have them meaningfully engaged while we anticipated the lockdown to be lifted before family tracing and unification will continue.
Yeah, I think uh, the COVID uh, um, saw uh, the COVID concerns uh, had the, the kids uh, in the center for over three months. Yeah, uh, for about four to five months. Yeah, but uh, we, we tried to manage and why we were we able to manage because we're, we're following through on what was happening in other contexts and uh, uh, which informed uh, the, um, um, the continuity plan for us here in, in Nigeria. Yeah, and also another challenge was that uh, social workers, we had uh, challenges with staff because we needed to limit, they reduce the number of people who have access to, to the kids because, uh, so that they also don't become exposed. So we needed to have, we had to get uh, some social workers to be permanently deployed to live in the, in the center for as long as, uh, uh, the the lockdown uh, uh, was going to last, and that also separated the social workers from their own family, from their own families. And you know, separation from families also have its own way of impacting on on the well being of the of the social workers and the facilitators in the center to to implement quality programming. So it was a kind of trying to see how we manage the situation with the children and also manage the situation with the with the uh, social workers and the facilitators and that have been trapped in the in the rehabilitation center working with the children thank you christopher um that is indeed i, I can imagine that the impact on the well-being of the social workers and the center staff is is considerable um irene i'd be interested in hearing how search for common grounds work and differed from um differed from goals and uh what were the challenges that that you faced um, in your programming and what were the adaptations? Yes, thank you. So as uh, my colleague uh, uh, Chris has mentioned, um, they work, World Prime works uh, with the children within the institutions and for Search for Common Ground, we usually start the reintegration uh, interventions after the children have been re uh, reunified with their, with their families or the alternative caregivers. So during this uh, COVID period, we faced uh, quite a number of challenges uh, and one of them was access because there was a period that the government uh, declared uh, lockdown. Uh, there was a long period and some of the activities we had to stop completely because we couldn't access um, uh, the families, but we maintained um, some of the critical activities like the case management of the high risk cases, because um, we have uh, community based uh, uh, case workers and also community based child protection committees. So they are the ones who are uh, going on with the case management and uh, what was happening is that the officers would provide them uh, virtual support uh, remotely and um, we also had uh, uh, a challenge uh, with the increased uh, level of psychological distress among the community members and this is because there were or some people were con concerned that we are integrating children uh, from other places maybe they're gonna they're going to bring uh, covid or something like this there were different kinds of anxieties that, that, that were, were, were circulating uh, uh, among the community members so um, we, what we did is that there was um, there was a lot there was a need for 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 sensitization within the communities. So through the case workers again and the community based child protection committees, we were able to provide information about COVID and all that to the communities to try and you know reduce the anxiety levels. But also we were working closely with this, with the other sectors, child protection subsector and the MHPSS uh, subsector. So MHPSS sector, sorry. So they provided as with, uh, with there was a hotline number that people could call uh, if they were experiencing psychological distress and they could receive uh, PSS services uh, through the phone. Then, um, like I mentioned, when we're providing the, 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 the reintegration package, we had uh, we have different uh, uh, services, we have different packages, and uh, one of such packages is economic reintegration. 
And at this point, I would mention that in Nigeria, it's allowed for children above the age of 18 to engage in light labor. So we kind of empower them through economic uh, reintegration package. And this was highly uh, affected because during this time, the price of items, uh, just the price of things just shot uh, to the roof. And we had a certain um, set amount per child that they would receive as a startup kit. So this was a, a big, a major uh, uh, challenge. And what we did is that we paired children together to, to form cooperatives so that at least they can uh, utilize uh, the, the different resources. If someone is receiving 5,000, the other one 5,000, they can combine and at least share, you know, some of the resources, uh, complement, I mean. So um, then there was uh, uh, the, the complaint coming from the caregivers, uh, especially those who were receiving uh, uh, children, the alternative caregivers, like they were already constrained uh, with uh, provision of basic needs for their families. And now there's an additional uh, uh, member of, to their families. So what, what are they going to do about, uh, you know, providing the basic services? And uh, through this, what happened is that we engaged with, uh, with uh, UNICEF, who are our donor, and uh, they, they provided us with some money that we could provide for emergency uh, case fund, and we could uh, take care of uh, some of the life-saving uh, uh, needs for these families uh, as we, you know, try to connect them with the other sectors where they can get uh, uh, more support. So um, there was also the, the the reintegration process takes a long time, you know, and there was already delay in implementation. So there were some activities that were really, really delayed, especially the ones that we had to stop in the beginning. So the time frame was not enough to complete all that. So again, we had to go back to the donor and you know request for an extension. This is how we were able to 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 achieve the targets. And finally, I'd like to mention that most of our activities were were, were greatly affected, uh, especially the social cohesion activities, because um, when we're doing the reintegration, we we have a component of uh, community social cohesion um, where we are we, we work with the community members to make sure that you know they are ready to receive the ch these children because if we just reintegrate children back to the communities you know there is uh, there is that uh, risk that the community might not be ready for that so we engage with a lot of transformative dialogues with the community members and this was highly affected because first of all at first, we couldn't conduct the, the transformative dialogue during the lockdown. And then afterwards, there was a limit as to how many people. Um, no, there was, there was first they, they opened uh, the, the lockdown, was lifted, but then you could not gather around uh, people together. Then they, they put the, the number of people that can be uh, in one sitting at a go. So we were not able to bring all the people that we wanted at once. So we had to, to have smaller, smaller groups. And this was, uh, was really affecting uh, our program implementation pace and all that. And the closure of the schools was also uh, affecting uh, the reintegration uh, because one of the packages is also social integration where we reintegrate children back to school and uh, also uh, helping these children to start uh, economic, uh, uh, to start up their own businesses, where even people who had started businesses before were already complaining that the business was really bad. They were not uh, 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 picking up because of the, the obvious uh, results of COVID-19. So what we did uh, to try and mitigate some of those uh, challenges is we worked uh, closely uh, with the community members, community child protection committees, so that they can monitor the children that were supported, for example, with the, with the startup kid, at least to make sure that 
they are supported through, you know, like they are able to start up and they're not uh, going to be tempted to sell the items or something like this. So they were like our eyes within the communities and just addressing summarizing issues uh, during this time. And then we also included radio, um, radio uh, sets in our back to school package because the government was offering the curriculum through the radio station. So we wanted the children that were reintegrated back to school to continue with the curriculum and not to lose out. And then we reviewed some of the modalities of the um, of some of the activities that we were conducting. For example, participatory theater that requires a lot of people to come together. We put, uh, we, we changed that completely into a radio uh, program. So um, that's how we were, some of, the, some of the measures that we put to try and mitigate, yeah. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I think it's really great that uh, those, those radios were included in the kits to ensure continued education. I know that that is one of the challenges faced during COVID-19 is, you know, how can we ensure that children are staying in school and are able to access, you know, remote, you know, education sessions. And so thinking ahead and mitigating that risk that they may not, you know, continue schooling by providing those radios is, you know, very, um, very prescient. Um, I think well thought out. And it's also interesting, the, the challenge in, in continuing work with the community-based child protection committees and, and continuing that aspect of reintegration work. There's been a lot of reliance on community members and community volunteers during COVID-19. And I think to see, um, to hear you speak about the challenges there is, is very interesting. Thank you. Um, Sandra, would you like to share Al Farouk's um, feedback on, and thoughts on this question? Yeah, sure. So um, Alpha worked also for an organization called um, IMSS. Um, and so in, in Mali, there were very similar challenges to the other countries, um, but mainly COVID-19 had a significant impact on the recruitment and use of uh, children by armed forces and armed groups. Um, so the situation has led to the permanent closure of traditional schools, community spaces, and um, many activities of the humanitarian sectors have been put on hold. Um, this has led to many children to drop out of school because of COVID. Um, there's been also an economic crisis that accompanied the, the spread of the virus that has led families to send their children to armed groups and armed forces to look for a better life and to improve household living conditions. And this pandemic in Mali came uh, in the context of an ongoing uh, security and humanitarian crisis that was already affecting many children. So it really exacerbated existing challenges that were already there in terms of access to services, food insecurity, and the lack of information. And all of this uh, factors has led to an increase in the number of, of children recruited. Um, COVID has also led to as in other countries, to difficulties to gather people. And IMSS in Mali is um, focusing its work on the prevention of recruitment and also identification and referrals of children. Um, and so this made this you know, context very challenging to operate and, and to implement those prevention activities that often are, uh, requires gathering of people in the community, for example. So what they've done in terms of adaptations um, was to reactivate some local child protection committees uh, who were in charge of raising awareness and also to do safe identification and referrals of uh, CAFAG. They also reactivated uh, RECOP, these are child protection community networks, um, which facilitate the release of CAFAG. And in addition to that, they also set up some focal points in neighborhoods and villages. Um, that includes some youth and elders from the community, some women uh, or girls, and, and they were also in charge of the identification of CAFAG as well as unaccompanied and supported children. And they have also set up a communication tree. Uh, which is very interesting where 
um, all of these actors knew where to report cases of CAFAG um, to the right stakeholders in a, in a timely manner so you wouldn't uh, waste time. Uh, they also organized this, what they call the Cascade Awareness, which I found very interesting. So they have about 240 youth um, that were trained on the prevention of recruitment and also on measures to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And these youth each had the objective to educate five people from their own community per month. So like this, they could reach a really large number of people without gathering it in a large number of, of people in one place. Uh, it also empowers youth uh, to be educators in their community. So that's a very interesting way of overcoming the, the challenges um, of COVID. They also did a door-to-door -door awareness campaign uh, on the same topic of prevention of recruitment and, and measures to prevent the spread of COVID. And uh, they have also used technology. Uh, they've set up a Facebook page for the dissemination of key messages on the recruitment and use of children and use some WhatsApp groups uh, for youth um, to access information, to also discuss sensitive issues in the, from their community and, and solutions. So these are some of the intervention, the adaptation that they've made. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sandra. I was having a hard time unmuting myself. Um, I think that cascade of wellness um, approach is so fascinating and really interesting to see how they've adapted their prevention activities um, to you know, still have such a large reach, but also to be keeping in mind the COVID-19 restrictions that we all have to operate within. Um, I think that is a, is a very inspiring method, and I think one that would be interesting to see if it would be useful in, in other contexts as well. Um, also interesting to hear about how, you know, this COVID-19 has exacerbated certain conditions that lead to recruitment and, you know, the work that needs to be done and how challenging it is to try to do this prevention work remotely. Um, I think very, all very interesting to hear. I'm glad that we're able to get those inputs. Um, our second question for the panel is on what impact do you think uh, COVID-19 will have on how we implement CAFOG programming in the future? What will this mean for the future of CAFOG programming and the approaches we will take? Um, Christopher, I would love to hear from you first on this question. How will COVID-19 impact the future of CAFOG programming? Like I said earlier, um, the COVID-19, it's, um, I, I, I choose to see um, these um, um, COVID-19 challenges from the lens of opportunities. Yeah, because uh, I think that um, the challenges we've seen uh, the past year, it's uh, an opportunity for us to actually do it better. Yeah, so although we anticipate a lot of, um, of uh, concerns around uh, how, okay, maybe business options, uh, programming options, like uh, when we do uh, the MHPS as a psychosocial support and all that, uh, we, we are not permitted to, 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 to have lots of crowd and uh, we limit to less than, than 15 and less than 20, which automatically implies that uh, there's a need for more facilitators, more social workers to, to, to have this engagement and follow up, and uh, or they have to work um, more than the usual time they, they, they do work. Let's say, for example, if a, if a facilitator was to work with uh, 50 children, for example, 50 car folks, for example, and uh, he, if we are still maintaining that social worker, it's, um, sorry, that uh, facilitator, the facilitator will not have to work like three times, he or she ordinarily is supposed to work. And that it automatically also means that in order for us not to stress that uh, have that uh, facilitator overwork, we may need to recruit more, all right? Which uh, brings us to funding now being uh, a challenge. You understand? So the ad adaptations 
the challenges and the, uh, our fast thinking initiatives and the adaptation also tells on our pocket, on the donor's pocket, right? And uh, we, it means that we still have to go back to the donors to say, oh, this uh, $1,000 was supposed to have implemented this reintegration program for this kid, but uh, COVID-19 is now projecting, is now bringing us a reality where we need to use, uh, we need $5,000 to, to implement an intervention that uh, we ordinarily would have implemented with $1,000. Uh, Irene gave uh, an instance of uh, an example of uh, they going back to UNICEF for an, a case management emergency fund as a result of the the impact of uh, of COVID. So the the impact is there. Uh, I, I, the the challenges are there. In a nutshell, the challenges are there. Uh, is an opportunity for us to be quick to think of how to do. Uh, continue with programming and but that also implies that uh, the pocket of the donor will, will will have to go back to the donor and uh, and uh, and it will also speak with the pocket of the donors and um, you also know funded in the north you have uh, the conflict and uh, it's in its 12th year now all right and uh, donor fatigue is already setting in and uh, there are other very competing priorities in terms of programming and uh, how do we go? Uh, it means that we still have to go back to our drawing board to see how we convince these donors on why, on why CAFAG uh, in, uh, reintegration programming has to be prioritized even, uh, even with the declining uh, funds and, uh, and also the, the numerous challenges as a result of the numerous challenges arising. I think that's an, an excellent point. And, and I actually made a note to ask about this willingness of donors to fund the needed changes. And I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists um, if you know the lessons learned and the changes that will need to happen to CAFAG programming, do they see this as being something, you know, how can we approach donors and convince donors on the needed additional investment when so much of child protection programming is already underfunded? Um, Vanessa. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this, as you mentioned, um, the challenge of funding and prioritization previously. Yeah, and I was going to speak to it also as I answer the second question. Um, what I was actually going to say was I'm going to be bold and stray off topic, but it looks like we went into the topic. Um, it's so difficult to talk about COVID-19 in a vacuum. Um, in South Sudan, like you have ongoing conflict, floods, locusts, food insecurity. Um, in the DRC, again, conflict. Uh, recently this year, a couple months ago, we had protests calling for the withdrawal of MINUSCO and at times NGOs, Ebola outbreaks, ongoing state of siege in select provinces, food insecurity. When you, when you talk about then COVID-19, you think about the myths associated with it, um, vaccine hesitancy and so many other things. So you have a situation where unfortunately COVID-19 isn't seen of as much of a priority or threat to the population. It's difficult to counteract that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the situation in which we're, we're working. And then when it comes to, uh, I mean, donors and, and funding, I mean, when you think about the impact of COVID-19 and the implementation of CAFAG programming in the future, what is going to happen to the forgotten crises like fr from a global perspective? I had mentioned that on a, on a broad scale, we already saw a diversion of funding that was originally allocated to CAFAG programming to support COVID-19 response, um, both in donor governments as well as internationally. Um, I mean, when you're talking about CAFAG and child protection, you have the HRP in both South Sudan and DRC, which are unbelievably underfunded. Um, and there's so many competing crises that even as programmers sitting in these countries and working in these countries, it's oftentimes um, hard to think about only COVID-19 and all the attention that we're placing on it. And I'm very much enjoying being on this panel, of course. Um, but when you consider the needs in, in these other areas, um, it's hard. Uh, if I can speak 
for a second outside of CAFAC programming. I do also want to recognize that donors have been good about making adjustments to existing programs. I mean, World Vision works across a lot of sectors in both countries. Um, and so where there was uh, existing programming, um, we saw donors be quite flexible about, okay, like what adjustments do you need to make? Um, you know, you're, you're going to have to do more training because of, of spacing and, and things like this and, and distancing and gathering sizes. Okay, so we can adapt for that. Um, but, I mean, you, you, you can't adjust timelines as much as you'd like. Um, expectations that are that you're still um, reaching the same number of beneficiaries that you had in those proposals. So as much as it was, okay, yes, let's make adaptations. Um, at the end of the day, you still have targets that you need to meet with donors, and you have so much else that is going in these countries. I see it with my colleagues, my staff, when I'm, you know, walking on the street. The attention on COVID-19, unfortunately, is just not there in, in, in these countries in the same way that it is um, in the global north. So, that's something that we need to be really cognizant of when having these conversations and, and not thinking about COVID-19 in the vacuum. I think that's a really excellent point, Vanessa, and I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it up because you're 100% correct. Like COVID-19 is not in a vacuum and it's very easy as someone who's, you know, calling in from Washington, D.C. to have that be, you know, on the forefront of my mind, but to remember that these contexts have, are dynamic and have, you know, other competing challenge, like challenges or, you know, pressing um, issues that, you know, might take precedence over COVID-19 and how can we ensure that we are programming so that we are keeping those in mind, but also with the reality of COVID-19 in the background and how very, very frequently with COVID-19, it's also about just how are we operating, how are we doing the work that we're doing um, to address these conflicts or the food insecurity, but in a way that we're not also then spreading COVID-19 through our work. Um, and it is a very much a complex, multi-layered challenge. Um, Irene, I'd love to hear from you as well. Being mindful of time, I still would like to hear from Irene and and Sandra on this on this second question about the impact of COVID-19 and how we will implement CAFAG programming in the future. Um, so I am sorry that we are running short on time, but Irene and, and Sandra, maybe if you can each give like a two minute um, update on your perspectives for this question. All right, yeah, thank you. So um, from uh, this context, there has been some uh, lessons learned and some best practices that we've documented coming from uh, the COVID-19 period. And uh, I would say one, in one way that, that it's going to affect the programming, the future programming is first of all, um, like my colleague uh, Chris mentioned, the budgetary uh, implication because we're going to have to put into consideration like the PPEs, and this is not just for integration. I believe it's for all the programs. So it goes back now to the donor again. We're going to need more money, but also keeping in mind that the donor funding is also shrinking. So um, that's that's one way that is going to affect and trying to find a balance, um, it's going to be a challenge, I think, uh, because then the money is not uh, enough as it is. Then uh, we also learned that uh, using, um, um, utilizing the community-based structures during this period is very important because when there is no access we know COVID-19 is here to stay. We don't know what could happen again. It could be another wave uh, and there could be another lockdown. But if we have community-based child, child protection uh, committees, well uh, prepared, well equipped with the resources that they need, uh, they can be able to continue this programming even to those areas where we cannot be able to access. And I would also mention that during this period, we had to look for local uh, um, local vendors, for example, for the items that we were needing. For example, the face masks, the detergents and all that, because the state was also locked down at some point and we couldn't get supplies from other places. And this led us to looking back into the former uh, supported 
children associated with armed group who had started their businesses. Some of them were tailors, so they were engaged in tailoring of uh, making the masks, and it turned out to be a very good success. In fact, uh, UNICEF embraced it, and they want to, you know, encourage other uh, uh, partners to also do the same and engage these children. Uh, to boost them, but also because it's, you know, it's uh, the resources are available uh, locally and they are much cheaper as it would, you know, sourcing from other places. And then I think another way that um, it's going to affect the programming is the modalities on how we conduct some of the activities. So we're not looking at any time soon having crowd uh, together. Uh, so we're going to have to cut down on number of people that we bring together at any given point. So again, when we're talking about uh, targets and all that, we're going to have to, you know, review that very well. We cannot, for example, we had uh, a participatory theater where we bring 100, 200 people together. We cannot do that anymore. We have to work with smaller groups. So moving forward, this is what what will happen and some of the programs that we moved to to, to radio programs um, they're going to be like that because uh, that way we have done uh, some some sort of assessment and it's still uh, 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 reaching the, the set target that, that you know we we, are, we were set to, to achieve. So I think it's uh, in a nutshell, those are some of the lessons that we learned from this uh, uh, period. Thank you. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, and then Sandra, we would love to hear from you. Yes, thanks. So um, I think for Al Farouk and, and his organization, some of the main adaptations that or the, the lessons learned that they would like to reuse for future programming are linked to the new technologies. Um, they really found uh, the use of smartphones, using Facebook pages, WhatsApp groups really worked well uh, to keep people connected, to reach also a large number of, of people at once, um, to deliver information uh, messages. And this is something they would like to keep using and they have this uh, very active Facebook page where youth um, post um, uh, dramas and recordings. And so it's, uh, it's a really great way to reach uh, a lot of people and to keep doing their prevention work. Um, they also like the system that they set up with the communication tree. This is something that they see really as a lessons learned and they'd like to continue in the future. Uh, also to report not only uh, cases of recruitment, but more widely incidents of the sixth grade violation against children during conflict. And the last point is, as um, Irene mentioned, is the involvement of the community. I think, you know, if we knew already that involving the community was important, uh, it was even more so during, during this crisis. And um, really this feeling that if we empower the community, if we work well with them, identify those key players and, and train them, um, they can protect their children, they can prevent recruitment, they can identify and refer children. And so working with the community while they're on the ground is really key for future programming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra, for presenting on behalf of Alpha Rook. Um, being mindful of time and knowing that we technically only have three minutes left to this uh, webinar, I'd like to, first of all, thank all of our panelists for their wonderful inputs. We had a lot of questions that we were not able to respond to during the um, during the, the webinar, so we will be adding these as comments to the live stream Facebook post um, and asking for some inputs from our panelists there if possible. Um, I would like to hand it over to um, Katie Robertson to briefly share the new CAFAG and COVID-19 resources that have been developed by the LMD Working Group. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Um, yes, just quickly. So we're really excited to let you know that we've got two new learning modules which are available in English, French, Spanish and Arabic via the Alliance website. So the first module is um, around CAFAG program continuity during COVID-19 um, aimed more at 
uh, manager and coordinator roles. It's a, a one day course for face to face delivery. There's also instructions to deliver it remotely via Zoom or another video calling platform built into the package. So um, if you've got kind of restrictions on meeting up, then there's an option to deliver it remotely. Um, and then the second module is um, CAFAG and COVID-19 is aimed primarily at officer level staff, um, but may be useful for some managers and coordinators who are involved in CAFAG programming as well. Um, managers and coordinators might wanna do both modules together. Uh, again, it's a one day written both as face-to-face -face and for um, remotely facilitated and available in all four languages on the Alliance website. I think that we've just shared the link in the chat where you can access the materials. That's it. Thanks, Michelle, back to you. Okay. Thanks so much, Katie. We are very excited that these resources are now up on the Alliance website and through the link shared in the chat. Um, as we come to the close of our time together, we would like to first of all thank all of you for attending from so many different contexts in different countries around the world, um, both those of you who are here on the, on the Zoom webinar with us, as well as those watching live on Facebook. Um, we would like to thank the Alliance and the LD Working Group uh, for their support and hard work on this project. Uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance for uh, funding this important piece of work and all of their support as well. And most importantly, our panelists for sharing what they have learned, the challenges they've encountered and the, the important work that they're doing. Um, thank you all so much for joining uh, today. We will be resuming the webinar series on September 29th for the final webinar in this six webinar series on the topic of mainstreaming child protection and health. So stay tuned for further information. And from all of us at the Alliance and the LD Working Group, thank you so much and have a great rest of your day.